Hi everyone, my name's Emily. I'm an environmental educator at Clay Pit Ponds State Park Preserve. And today, I'm gonna to be leading you in a pond dipping demonstration. This pond dipping is a part of a community science initiative that we're participating in called the Earth Echo Water Challenge. The Earth Echo Water Challenge is a global initiative that shows water quality for any body of water on Earth that has data that has been submitted. So we are gonna submit data to this wonderful resource, and so anybody throughout the entire world will be able to look at Sherrod's Pond and see the water quality data for this beautiful body of water. So you might be wondering, what is a pond dipping? In a pond dipping, we're looking for things called macroinvertebrates. Do you know what a macroinvertebrate is? A macroinvertebrate is a compound word, macro and invertebrate. What's the word macro mean? The word macro means uh, an animal or anything that you can see with your naked eye. That's big enough to where you can see it without a microscope, or without you know any aids to your eye. And then the word invertebrate. What does the word invertebrate mean? The word invertebrate means an animal that does not have a backbone. Invertebrate, no vertebrae. So, macro invertebrates are animals that don't have backbones that are large enough to where you can see them with your naked eye. So, let's think about some examples of macro invertebrates. Is a snail a macro invertebrate? Yes, a snail is a macro invertebrate. It's big enough where we can see it with our naked eye and it doesn't have a backbone. What about a beetle? Is a beetle a macroinvertebrate? Yes, a beetle is a macroinvertebrate. It's big enough to where you can see it with your naked eye and it doesn't have a backbone. What about bacteria? Is bacteria a macroinvertebrate? Hmm. Well, bacteria don't have backbones, but they're not big enough to where we can't see them with our naked eye. We would need a microscope to help us. And finally, what about a tadpole? Is a tadpole a macroinvertebrate? No, a tadpole's not a macroinvertebrate. Tadpoles grow into frogs. Frogs are amphibians. They have backbones, so they're not considered macroinvertebrates. The reason why we're looking for macroinvertebrates today is because based on the different types that we find, we can tell how healthy the quality of the water is. Certain macroinvertebrates cannot live in polluted water. So if we find them, we know there must not be that much pollution in this water. If we only find types that are tolerant of pollution, or types of macroinvertebrates that can live in polluted water, then we might think, hmm, this might be a little bit polluted if we can't find any of those uh, pollution intolerant macroinvertebrates. So, let's get started pond dipping. The first thing you need when you're gonna go pond dipping is a net. This is the most important tool that we're gonna use today. This is the net that we use when we lead this as a program with school groups and with summer camps. It's a very great net that we ordered from Carolina Biological Supply. And you can notice that the sides of the net are made out of canvas, but the center of the net is a fine screen. It's a little bit finer than a window screen. So this is a great net because since the pores in the screen are so fine, a lot of the really small macroinvertebrates can't go through those pores. So we can catch a lot of different types in this net. Another net that you could use is this one. We also ordered this one from Carolina Biological Supply. It's called a macroinvertebrate net, but this net doesn't have as fine of mesh as the other net. So some of the macroinvertebrates, especially the tinier damselflies, can fit through these holes in this net. So this net is okay to use if it's the only one that you have, but we definitely prefer the other one because it has a finer screen in the net. And finally, another net that you could use is this one. This is a great one for people to use who are just doing this as community members. So if you have a fish tank, you might have one of these things. This net is great because it has fine mesh, like our favorite net, 
Uh, the only problem with it is it's short, so if you're gonna try to dip in the pond, you have to get really, really close. So that's the only setback to this one. But we would recommend you use one of these two nets when you're gonna be pond dipping. The other one is okay too, but you need a net to do a pond dip. The next tool that you'll need is a tray of water. So we have a really special flat tray here. It has a pouring edge that's very nice for when we're done with our sample. We can put it into the water very gently. Um, but we want a tray with a large surface area where you can see a wide area of the top of the water because this is where you're going to be looking for your macro invertebrates. These are the only two things you really need to do a pond dipping besides a pond or a stream or other body of water. But another tool that you might want to use are plastic cups. So we reuse these plastic cups every time we do this program and it helps us to catch each macro invertebrate in a cup and look at it on its own so we can focus more into it. Especially when we're leading this with a group, we can pass the cups around and have each person who's participating really observe that macro invertebrate instead of having to pick them out of the tray when they're all swimming around each other. So those are the three things you need to do a pond dipping. Another thing that you could use is a field guide. So we have a couple of different examples that you could use, but the best way uh, to do this is to look for one online that is local to your area. So if you can find one for us on Staten Island, a macroinvertebrate key that somebody already made, you should use that one. But any macroinvertebrate key from New York or Connecticut or New Jersey will be fine. So the ones that we've used are this one we ordered from Carolina Biological Supply. It's called Freshwater Aquatic Macroinvertebrates Insect Life Cycle and Habitat. These cards are great because they'll show the adult version of the insect as well as the other life stages of the insect. So you don't find always the adult version of the insect inside the pond. Often, the adult versions of these insects lay their eggs in the pond, and then when the eggs hatch, the larvae of these insects live in the pond and swim around the pond. And then, once they metamorphosize into the adult version, they can fly away and leave the pond. Not for all the macroinvertebrates we're talking about, but some of them. So these cards are definitely the best resource that you could use because there's a ton of them. This is another macroinvertebrate identification key. And this one is good because it breaks the macroinvertebrates up into groups. And you'll notice that the groups say whether these macroinvertebrates are tolerant or intolerant of pollution. So group one on this set sheet says very intolerant of pollution. Group two, moderately intolerant of pollution. Group three, fairly tolerant of pollution and group four, very tolerant of pollution. So when you're filling out your Earth Echo Water Challenge sheet, this field guide would help you out a lot because when you're filling out the Earth Echo sheet, it groups the macroinvertebrates by how sensitive they are to pollution. So even if you don't find the species that you found on the Earth Echo Challenge, you can still mark that you found uh, a group three type of macroinvertebrate which would be pollution tolerant. So, these are all the aids that you can use for pond dipping, and now we're actually gonna do the pond dipping. So, I'm gonna use my favorite net, and what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna skim the top of the pond. I don't wanna put my net all the way to the bottom. I would probably find more macroinvertebrates that way, but when I scoop up a bunch of mud, it makes my, my white tray really cloudy and then it's hard to find the macroinvertebrates swimming around. So I'm just gonna try to scoop the clear water and I'm gonna try to scrape the plants as much as I can because there might be some insects clinging to those plants. So I'm gonna scrape this spatter dock here and again, only skim my net on the top of the water. I only did a tiny little skim and now I'm gonna drop off what I caught in my tray. To do that, I'm gonna turn my net inside out and I'm gonna dip it like a tea bag into the tray of water, just like that. That's gonna knock out any macroinvertebrates that are clinging to the net. 
after I do that, if I have a lot of leaves in the tray, I can swirl them around with my hands and then throw them back in the water. After I do that, I'm gonna give the water a second to settle, and then I'm gonna see if I see anything swimming around in there, which yes, I already do. So this is the point at which I would use one of my handy dandy little cups. I see a macroinvertebrate swimming right here. I'm gonna use this cup to catch that macroinvertebrate. So what I'm gonna do is, I see it right in front of me here, I'm gonna put the cup straight down into the water. That sucks the macroinvertebrate in like a vacuum, but this guy's swimming around. There we go. So now you can see what we caught. And it looks like a little aquatic beetle. Let's see if we can see anything else. I do see another aquatic macroinvertebrate in here. Let's see if I can catch it. So I'm gonna put my cup straight down behind it and it gets sucked in like a vacuum. Can you tell me what's that macroinvertebrate? What type of macroinvertebrate is this? What's that thing on its back? It's a shell, hmm. What animal has a shell? It's a snail. We found a snail. Let's see if we can find anything else. I'm gonna dip again from another area of the pond. Hmm. This is a dragonfly nymph. Adult dragonflies have very long abdomens. They'll fly along above the pond and they'll dip their abdomen into the pond. And when they do that, they're laying their eggs into the pond. When those eggs hatch, they hatch into this dragonfly nymph. The dragonfly nymph is a carnivore. It hunts all the other macroinvertebrates that live under the water. It has a double jaw that comes out like alien. So. It has a jaw that opens from the sides like this, and then it has another jaw that comes out like an arm and snatches the macroinvertebrate in front of it and eats it. Dragonflies are voracious predators. Uh, when they become adults, they're some of the best flyers in the world. Look at this other guy we found. This is a back swimmer. When they get bigger, you can see that their legs look like they're in the air and they look like they're swimming on the, their back. That's how they got their name. You see that on the sides of its body are two long arms that it uses to propel itself through the water. The top of the back swimmer, when we're looking down into the pond, is darkly colored. But if you were a fish looking up at it from underneath, you'll notice that it is lightly colored. It almost looks white. This is called counter shading. This is an adaptation. Can you think of another animal that lives in water that has a black back and then a white belly? Did you guess a penguin? How about a killer whale? <laughs> Very good. So animals that look down on these other animals from above the water will see darkness. They'll see a dark back blending in with the dark color of the water. But if you're a fish looking up and you see the bug from underneath, you'll see a white belly that'll look like it blends in with the sky and clouds. So this is a type of camouflage that helps protect this insect from predation. So these are just a few of the macroinvertebrates that we found today. There are many more inside of our pond, but based on what we found, we can f we've found that uh, the types of macroinvertebrates that we're seeing today are somewhat tolerant of pollution. Finding the dragonfly nymph means that our water isn't so polluted that the dragonfly nymph can't live here. 
but we didn't find any caddis flies today, which isn't a great sign. That doesn't mean that they're not here. We've only been out here for about 15 minutes doing scoops. Um, but if we did more samples throughout the year and we found that we didn't find any caddis flies, um, that would be a bad sign. Maybe we would have to investigate. Why aren't we finding caddis flies anymore? Something happened to this water body to make them disappear? We've been finding them for the past five years. Why is this year different? The last thing that you want to do when you're done with your dipping is you want to return the animals that you caught to the water and you don't want to make them do any high dives. So I'm going to take my tray as close as I can to the surface of the water and I'm just going to gently pour them back in without making a splash because this could hurt some of the animals that were in the sample. If I see that there's any snails still clinging on to my tray, I'm going to gently grab them by the shell and just place them back in the water. And I don't see any more animals. I could give my tray a little bit of rinse with the pond water, just to make sure that I got everything out. And that looks good. Remember, if you're gonna be testing different bodies of water, you're gonna to wanna to clean all of your equipment between those bodies of water. So today, I sampled at Sherrod's Pond. If I go to sample at Good's Pond tomorrow, I'm just gonna wash with soapy water all of the equipment that I use. That means the nets, my trays. If I used waders, I would rinse those because I don't want anything that's in this pond get into Good's Pond, which maybe shouldn't get there or wouldn't naturally get there on its own. This is especially important when you're moving between bodies of water that are in different counties or are much further away than within the same park because you might have an uh, invasive insect that's present in one end of the state of New York, but maybe not farther up north. If you don't clean your equipment between going in those bodies of water, you could be the person that brings that invasive insect up north. So cleaning your equipment is very, very important. Thank you so much for helping out with this community science initiative. Remember, it's not community science if you don't share your results. So make sure that once you dip for your macroinvertebrates, you share what you found on the Earth Echo website. When you go to the Earth Echo Water Challenge website, find the button for Add Results. This will bring up a new tab. If you don't already have an account, be sure to create one. Once you've logged in, it's time to add your results. If you know that the site has previously been tested, such as Share Its Pond, then you can go right into adding results. Find the site by searching the name and selecting the correct location. The website will ask you to fill in questions such as the visit information, site conditions, water quality data, and macroinvertebrate data. Today we just tested for macroinvertebrates, so that's all I'm filling in. There are photos to help, and the invertebrates are categorized as pollution-sensitive, somewhat pollution-tolerant, and pollution-tolerant. Fill it out, and then you can hit submit. Congrats. You are a community scientist. Thanks again for joining me. Stay tuned all week for more information about water.